We are tree herders, we old ents. Few enough of us are left now. Sheep get like shepherds, and shepherds like sheep, it is said. But slowly, and neither have long in the world. It is quicker and closer with trees and ents, and they walk down the ages together. For ants are more like elves, less interested in themselves than men are, and better at getting inside other things. And yet again, ants are more like men, more changeable than elves are, and quicker at taking the color of the outside, you might say. Or better than both, for they are steadier, and keep their minds on things longer. Hey there, gang. I'm Danny J. And I'm Joel N. I'm Trevor D. And together, we are... Keep, Keep on talking. And hey. We're, hey, 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 we're just kind of wishing that Treebeard would uh, shut the fuck up <laughs> for a while. There's going to be a lot of Treebeard just talking, talking, talking in this episode, guys, because we're talking about ants, right? Going to be talking about ants, but but first, uh, but first, this is uh, the beginning of season eight. Thanks for coming back, you guys. Yeah. So uh, season eight is uh, going to be a little bit different than we've been doing. We're going to start off with a four episode run here. Yeah. It's normally, be, uh, normally we split it into two six episode runs. Yeah. But because four episodes, if you're doing your math, this is episode ninety six, brings us up to what? Episode one hundred. That's right. Boo, 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 boo. We're going to hit 100 episodes this season, friends. Yes. We got some special plans. We do have very, very special plans, and uh, they need their own time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's why we're doing the four episode run. And then uh, the. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of uh, a run of six and a run of six, we're going to do a run of four and a run of eight. Yeah. So hold on to your butts. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a nice like uh, preview into the big meat of the project. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. So yeah, stay we're, tuned we're, for that. We're just very excited about it. I don't know if you we're can super tell. excited. We, uh, I think we had the what we're doing, <laughs> what we're doing for the for one hundredth <laughs> episode. We had this idea to do this probably about thirty or forty episodes into the series. Right. Yeah. It was like years ago we came up with this idea, but we're like, I don't know if we're quite good enough yet. Yeah, we'll see. Is what we'll, we said. We'll see. But well, we, you're going to find out. We think the time is right. Oh, yeah. Let's focus on today. Guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the future. Today. Okay. So today, episode 96. Thanks for tuning back in. We're going to be talking about the race of Ents. Yeah. Briefly, who are the Ents? Like uh, Treebeard and his people. Of course. They're created to protect the trees of Middle Earth. Yes. Yeah. And uh, like the elves, they are extremely long-lived. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, almost immortal? They, like, they can be destroyed. Like, but, damn near, yeah, like, but they're without, de facto immortal. Yeah, yeah, they're one of those races, like, without, uh, you know, any issues, they'll go on to... They'll just continue. They'll continue. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but elves go back to uh, Valinor, right? They do. Uh, and, even even in death, right? Like, their their spirit, right? It's true. Mm-hmm. Ents? That's a good question. We don't know. Are we they bound know. to the earth the same way the elves are? Probably, I don't know. If they live as long. Oh. Yeah, because they're, well, they're not Maiar, so they don't do the Maiar thing, right? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Look at this. Mm-hmm. Tolkieniering. What are we, like two minutes into the episode? We're already getting we're already, our first Tolkieniering? God, Holy shit. We're already getting philosophical. Getting into yeah, it. Yeah, we're like 30 seconds into the episode. <laughs> let's, so let's start off with some just general names. names and titles for Ents. Yeah, we love our names. So we've got, as you know, the, the name Ent, which is actually a word from real life. Tolkien actually took that straight out of real life Old English. Straight up Anglo-Saxon. Yep, that's uh, Old English for the word giant. So he's just kind of recycling an Old English word there. There you go. We also have Anadrim, which is Sindarin for tree folk. Yeah. And, uh, ooh, I'll try to say this, Anyalie. I think that's right. I think you nailed it, my friend. I think friend. you got it. Uh, which is Quenya, also for, for tree folk. Yeah, and then we got Shepherds of the Trees, which is fun. I love that one. Uh, which uh, Tree Folk, just the uh, you know translation of the other two. And Wood Demons. Who, wood Demons. No kidding. Who says Wood Demons, Joel? Probably the dwarves. <laughs> Probably the dwarves, yeah. Uh, that's what I'm imagining, too. All right, so let's, let's, let's get into the origins of the Ents. But in order to really do that, 
we've got to go way back to, to really understand the ends and the reason for the ends being created. We've got to go all the way back to the ears of the trees and talk about Yavanna and Aule. Right. Everyone's favorite power couple. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna you know rewind the clocks and go back and check in with these guys right shortly after Aule had created the dwarves. This is where we're stepping into the story. Way back machine. So as we've learned previously, Aule created the dwarves in secret, and he did this without consulting any of the other Valar. And uh, because of this, the dwarves did not develop the love and respect for nature that Yavanna would have preferred. Shitty. Yeah. However, Aule also pointed out that this was kind of going to be the case with all of the children of Ilavatar, not just the dwarves. We've got a uh, excerpt here about this conversation, read by Danny. This is from the Silmarillion, Chapter 2 of Aule and Yavanna. Because thou hiddest this thought from me until its achievement, thy children will have little love for the things of my love. They will love first the things made by their own hands, as doth their father. They will delve in the earth, and the things that grow and live upon the earth they will not heed. Many a tree shall feel the bite of their iron without pity. But Aule answered, That shall also be true of the children of Elevatar, for they will eat and they will build. Eru will give them dominion, and they shall use all that they find in Arda. Yeah, pretty straightforward. He's like, this is this is kind of how it's going to be. Yeah, like, sorry. I mean, like, there's going to be some conflict when you're creating a uh, uh, an ecosystem, right? Well, right, <laughs> like, exactly, exactly. Like, yeah, like, I mean, anytime you're creating a, an interdependent uh, web of things, like, things got to die, things got to be born, mm-hmm. things got, you know what I mean? It's exactly. Just, it's just the way the cookie crumbles, as they the, say, the right? The circle of life. The circle of life. Yeah, that's Elton John, right? Isn't it? He did the soundtrack for Lion King, right? <laughs> I'm, what? Not, I'm not sure, actually. I'm pretty sure it is Elton John, yeah. Well, so, naturally learning this upset Yovana deeply, because she really loves all of her creations, all of her plants that she's created. She loves them all dearly. And so, Yovana went to Manway for counsel about this. And we've got a, another excerpt here from that same chapter of Aule and Yovana, read by Trevor. My heart is anxious, thinking of the days to come. All my works are dear to me. Is it not enough that Melkor should have marred so many? Shall nothing that I have devised be free from the dominion of others? If thou hadst thy will, what wouldst thou reserve? said Manway. Of all thy realm, what dost thou hold dearest? All have their worth, said Yavanna, and each contributes to the worth of the others. But the Kelvar can flee or defend themselves, whereas the Alvar that grow cannot. And among these I hold trees dear. Long in the growing, swift shall they be in the felling, and unless they pay toll with fruit upon bough, little mourned in their passing. So I see in my thought, would that the trees might speak on behalf of all things that have roots, and punish those that wrong them. This is a strange thought, said Manway. I love Manway's input there. This is strange. Such always doing such great work, Manway. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Good observation. Kind of a weirdo, Yvonne. I don't know. That's strange. Strange. Yeah. Yup. Thanks, Manway. Yeah, I don't know if Manway is supposed to be like a um, a stand-in for ineffective government, but he really, uh, (laughs) really kind of is. Honestly, I can feel that. (laughs) Yeah, it's just like we go to him all the time asking him for shit, and he just kind of lets it fly. Just didn't even understand how Melkor could be evil. I just can't really comprehend it, I guess. It'll be cool. You think his manway just drunk all the time? Like, yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, he's just a little (laughs) insane. He's always half in the bag. Yeah. (laughs) So after meditating on Yavanna's request, Manway received inspiration from Ilavatar, and confirmed that her wish to protect her creations would be granted. Sick. And uh, we have an excerpt from this same chapter two of Aula and Yavanna, read by Joel. Then Manwe spoke and said, O Kementari, Eru hath spoken, saying, Behold, when the children awake, then the thought of Yavanna will awake also, and it will summon spirits from afar, and they will go among the Kelvar and the Olvar, and some will dwell therein and be held in reverence, and their just anger shall be feared. For a time, while the firstborn are in their power, and while the secondborn are young, 
Then Yavanna was glad, and she stood up, reaching her arms towards the heavens, and she said, I shall climb the trees of Kementari, that the eagles of the king may house therein. Nay, said Manwe, only the trees of Aule will be tall enough. In the mountains the eagle shall house, and hear the voices of those who call upon us. But in the forests shall walk the shepherds of the trees. Then Yavanna returned to Aule. Eru is bountiful, she said. Now let thy children beware, for there shall wake a power there shall walk a power in the forests whose wrath they will arouse at their peril. Arouse it at your peril, dude. You know what I mean? Don't want to arouse the trees. Yeah. It will be your peril. I feel like they'll give you a real hard time. <laughs> I like that <laughs> shit. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, ants, they came into being at around the same time as the elves. This is way back in the years of the trees, which we all remember. Classic time period, right? Classic, classic. Yeah, originally, ants, could, they could be found almost anywhere in Middle Earth, in all of the woods and forests spread around the world. But by the Third Age, they were only known to mainly dwell in, 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 in Fengorn Forest. Yeah, right? well, yeah, and uh, we'll get a little bit more into that uh, later on here in the episode. It's, it almost sounds like they might be an uh, endangered species. Yeah, yeah, in a way. In a way. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the characteristics of the Ents here. Yeah, Ents were tall creatures, uh, like humanoid trees with very thick skin resembling tree bark. They varied in height, size, coloring, and in the number of fingers and toes. Weird. That, that's interesting. An individual Ent usually resembled the species of the tree they guarded. Oh, yeah. so they, they guarded trees? Oh, right, because they're, they're here to protect trees. Right, right, right. Yeah, right shepherds, okay. of the, shepherds of the trees, bro. I see. Yeah. But we've got an excerpt here kind of describing Ents. This is from Chapter 4, Treebeard, from The Two Towers, Book 3, read by Danny. As they drew near, the hobbits gazed at them. They had expected to see a number of creatures as much like Treebeard as one hobbit is like another, and they were very much surprised to see nothing of the kind. The Ents were as different from one another as trees from trees, some as different as one tree is from another of the same name but quite different growth in history, and some as different as one tree kind from another, as birch from beech, oak from fir. There were a few older Ents, bearded and gnarled like hale but ancient trees, though none looked as ancient as Treebeard. And there were tall, strong ants, clean-limbed and smooth-skinned like forest trees in their prime. A lot of variety there in the ants. Yeah. Smooth-skinned trees? What's up, smooth-skinned? Yeah. That just kind of kind of sounds uh, weird, actually. I that's mean, there the... are some smooth skin. I mean, think of like birch trees. That's kind of a smooth-barked tree. They exist. I was just thinking of ghouls and fallout that smooth skin. Remember, that's what they call, like, normies? They call call you a smooth skin. Because right, you still have skin. Yeah, exactly. And anyway, funny. tree skin, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> trees, very, ants are very varied from each other. Very, you know, large yeah. variety. A lot of different types of ants, as there are different types of trees. Though Treebeard, specifically, is described as being about 14 feet tall. It's about four meters. Man-like and clad in something that could have been tree bark. And he had seven toes and a bushy, almost twiggy beard and deep, penetrating eyes. We've got a lovely description here from that same chapter, Tree Beard from the Two Towers, read by Trevor. They found that they were looking at a most extraordinary face. It belonged to a large, man-like, almost troll-like figure, at least 14 foot high, very sturdy, with a tall head and hardly any neck. Whether it was clad in stuff like green and gray bark, or whether that was its hide was difficult to say. At any rate, the arms, at a short distance from the trunk, were not wrinkled, but covered with a brown smooth skin. The large feet had seven toes each. The lower part of the long face was covered with a sweeping gray beard, bushy, almost twiggy at the roots, thin and mossy at the ends. But at the moment the hobbits noted little but the eyes. These deep eyes were now surveying them, slow and solemn, but very penetrating. They were brown, shot with green light. One felt as if there was an enormous well behind them, filled up with ages of memory and long, slow, steady thinking. But their surface was sparkling with the present, 
like sun shimmering on the outer leaves of a vast tree or on the ripples of a very deep lake. It felt as if something that grew in the ground asleep, or just feeling itself as something between root tip and leaf tip, between deep earth and sky, had suddenly waked up and was considering you with the same slow care that it had given to its own inside affairs for endless years. By God. Yeah. Wow. I just everything to do with Ents is very drawn out. Even yeah. Tolkien's description of Ents right. is just very long winded. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost funny. It's it's I love it. I don't know. I love it too. I can literally like picture Treebeard's face in my mind. Yeah. Reading over that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so good. Um, here's a fun here, here's a little fun bit of information. In April of, tw- of 2019, someone at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we've been there, been there. Um, calculated uh, that the length of an average ant stride would be about four feet. Yeah, I'm guessing that's based off of tree beards measurements that we get. Mm. But yeah, that would come out to about 2.2 strides per second. And that means an end could cover a speed of about six miles per hour just walking at a regular pace. Wow. Which is pretty crazy. Now, as fun of a fact as this is, I found this on the internet on one of the wikis, but I could not actually find the source. I don't know if it was an essay paper or, you know, some official research done by, you know, someone there at the university. I, I'm not yeah, really sure. That's kind of interesting, too. I, I was wondering, I, I, I was bummed that we couldn't find it because... Yeah, uh, I was looking at it and I could not. If anyone out there knows the source The source of on this, that, let us know. Because it could be one of um, the nerds that we know... <laughs> That put on the uh, the, uh, the Art exhibit. of the Manuscript exhibit yeah. at, Mar- at Marquette University that we went to see uh, a while back. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Marquette University is somewhat special, yes. especially in the U.S. because it has such a large trove of Tolkien's like works, artifacts, really, and artifacts, yeah. transcripts, mm-hmm. books, and things. Uh, yeah. It's really something. They had the Art of the Manuscript exhibit that was, gosh, that was a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, almost, yeah. And uh, if you want to hear more about that, we did two full episodes. We did. Or, well, we had a companion piece and a full episode Yes. Um, about that. It's super, super cool. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Check that out. Yes, that was amazing. Go check that out. Marquette rules. So, moving forward with our Ents. So, Ents are known also, fun fact, for living in Ent houses and getting their nourishment from something called and draw and drafts. Ooh, see now we okay. This is we got to have this conversation, guys. On I'm this, a dumb American. I'm, I'm a dumb. American. We are we are dumb Americans. And on this podcast before, we have used the word draught. So here's the thing: that is just the word draft. D r a u g h t. Yeah, in America, we spell that word d r a f t. Yeah, <laughs> just real. <laughs> yeah real simple so we didn't know so in forgive us in our old episodes we we're gonna try to go ahead and say draft you mm-hmm. know because it's right. proper i i try to when i learn these things i try to be better like how for a while i was saying farmer giles for a yeah. long time yeah i was mispronouncing giles giles i'm learning we're getting it we're getting it but yeah and drafts that's how they get their nourishment yeah so we thought we'd take a minute to talk about ant houses and ant drafts Let's do it. I'm oh. excited about this. I've always kind of been curious about what ants eat. Yeah, what do they get up exactly. to? How do they how do they do it? Well, let's start with ant houses. So these were obviously the homes of the ants, and these homes were also just as varied in nature as the ants were themselves. Yeah, some were relatively large and complex, while others were sm- simple and uh, of more modest size. Treebeard had several ant houses in Fangorn Forest, and uh, one of these was Welling Hall, which included a tree-lined courtyard, furnishings and a rocky bay with a curtain of falling water Mm. yeah beautiful we've got a beautiful excerpt from the two towers chapter tree beard chapter four uh read by who do we got joel yeah take it away a lot of these excerpts i'd say most of these excerpts are are gonna be from the the chapter tree beard just because that is a very long chapter oh yes and we get so much information about the it is the only chapter in my opinion that could be accused of being boring. Now, I know a lot of people think that Tolkien is just always boring. I don't. I think it's riveting. But, like, this chapter could be, on on certain days, considered a little boring. It's like the epitome of his drawn-out, 
descriptions in right. lengthy dialogues. Everything that people criticize Tolkien for is in this chapter. Many, many names for one thing. <laughs> right. Yes. Yep. Okay. To that excerpt. I'm sorry. Yeah, do it up, Joel. Suddenly before them, the hobbits saw a wide opening. Two great trees stood there, one on either side, like living gateposts. But there was no gate save their crossing and interwoven boughs. As the old end approached, the trees lifted up their branches, and all their leaves quivered and rustled. Beyond them was a wide, level space, as though the floor of a great hall had been cut into the side of the hill. On either hand, the walls sloped upward, until they were fifty feet high or more, and along each wall stood an aisle of trees that also increased in height as they marched inwards. At the far end, the rock wall was sheer, but at the bottom, it had been hollowed back into, the, into a shallow bay with an arched roof. A little stream escaped from the spring above, and leaving the main water, fell tinkling down the sheer face of the wall, pouring in silver drops like a fine curtain in front of the arched bay. For a moment, Treebeard stood under the rain of the falling spring and took a deep breath. Then he laughed and passed inside. A great stone table stood there, but no chairs. This is an end house, Treebeard said, and there are no seats, I fear, but you may sit on the table. Picking up the hobbits, he set them on the great stone slab six feet above the ground, and there they sat dangling their legs. Awesome. I love that. It is kind six of funny. Feet off the ground. It is kind of funny to think of like the smallest race like a particularly small race of people, hobbits, mm-hmm. going to an end house, which is like particularly large. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's a uh, incongruent humor. Is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, that table's as tall as I am. Like right, <laughs> that, that right. table's yeah. as tall as I am. If there yeah. were chairs, you'd be climbing up onto them. I would be able to just pro- just see above that table. I think, like, just my eyes above. You that could table. just you could stand there yeah. and see what was going on. I could, yeah, I could see the food on the table, but not eat it. You'd be like the cat sitting on the chair. Yeah. You could yeah. see what was going on. Yep. Well, another thing that all ant houses had in common was a source of fresh water, because that's what they would use to make their ant drafts. Yes. And said plumbing. Um, I um, mean. They had a source of water. I don't know that they needed to flush anything, but yeah, I guess you could say they had a running water. Like aquaculture. Isn't that what they call it? Aquaculture? Yeah, I think that's what it's called. I, I, I guess, maybe. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they, they manipulate water. They have aqueducts in a way. <laughs> yeah. So on the note, let's talk a little bit more about ant drafts. Yes. Ant drafts, they were um, the mysterious drafts of the ants that were uh, their primary sur- source of nourishment. Ants don't eat anything. Right. Yeah. They, don't, they don't chew on shit and swallow it like very no, tree-like, like most things do. And what do they do? They taste? Do you think they do drink with their mouths, but they don't really eat solid foods. Yeah. Mm. So nothing much is really known about the contents of the ant drafts. These drinks, only that they are made from river water and possibly mixed with other things or manipulated in some other way. I think mm-hmm. this actually came up in one of our other episodes. We suspected they could be fermented. Uh, yeah, we uh, because they use the word draft, which is a type of like uh, fermented uh, drink, right? Like mm-hmm. a beer. We we concluded in our 420 episode that they were alcoholic, so we had them on the list. Yeah, but also because of the effects too. Which we'll but also because of the second. effects, which we'll get into in a second here. Yep. So the ant drafts they came in two different varieties that we know of. One that refreshes, like a drink of water would be for us, and one Mm -hmm. that nourishes, you know, like food. Like food. For the trees. They were known to have been kept in large stone jars and then ladled out onto large bowls. Lurped up. Slurpy, slurpy. slurpy. (laughs) After drinking them, the ants preferred to lie down so that the drink would not rise immediately to their heads. Which... Hey, that's an effect, man. That's potentially a that's psychological something. effect they're talking that, about. That's, that's why we had it in yeah, the 420 yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it was known for causing that refreshing feeling and that vigor that kind of like coursed through your body. We've got a good excerpt here about that from, again, The Two Towers, the chapter Treebeard, read by Danny. The drink was like water. Indeed, very like the rest of the drafts that they had drunk from the ant wash near the borders of the forest. And yet, there was some scent or savor in it which they could not describe. It was faint, but it reminded them of the smell of a distant wood borne from afar by a cool breeze at night. 
The effect of the draft began at the toes and rose steadily through every limb, bringing refreshment and vigor as it coursed upwards, right to the tips of the hair. Indeed, the hobbits felt that the hair on their heads was actually standing up, waving and curling and growing. That really does sound quite pleasant. It reminded them of the smell of distant wood, born afar from a cool breeze at night. That's, yeah, I love that. That, that, sounds, love that. that sounds wonderful. Yeah. S- starting at your toes, though, and then like feeling it rise through your body would be very strange. Well, that that's kind of how alcohol feels, right? Yeah. A little bit? Yeah, that's what I was going to... You kind of feel it in That's kind of, I guess, what I equate In your fingers when you're starting to get drunk, right? I guess like, fingers, but I, I, don't, I don't really think about that from the toes. Fingers and toes. Fingers and toes. Are just, what are the fingers? The foot toe. Foot fingers? <laughs> yeah, what, are, what are toes? What are toes but foot fingers? That's what, what I was trying to say. Fingers fingers fingers. What are toes but foot fingers? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean... We did come from apes in which they were exactly that, so... Yes, yeah, Australopithecines had opposable thumbs on their feet. And now we just got stupid big toes. Yeah. Stupid <laughs> big toes. Dumb. Could you imagine, if you had an opposable thumb on your toe, could That'd you imagine so stubbing cool. that bastard? Oh, oh my that God. Would hurt. That would hurt real bad. No wonder we just got rid of that. <laughs> I suppose after pe- humans started walking a lot, they yeah. probably kept stubbing their toe thumbs. Exactly. Their foot yeah. thumbs. That's why we got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. That's why we got rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Man. Well, back back to this moment yeah, where, well, yeah, where yeah. the hobbits were drinking some oh, head yeah. draft. Yeah. You don't want to talk more about biological anthropology? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong podcast. Yeah. <laughs> This is the only recorded time uh, that an ant draft was consumed by someone other than an ant. And that, you know, by Marion Pippin in the Fangorn Forest. Yeah, mm-hmm. right here. And as a result of drinking the ant draft, Marion Pippin grew to be the largest hobbits in the Shire, adding uh, at least two to three inches to their height, which for a hobbit is pretty significant. That's pretty significant. Yeah. 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 So ant drafts and ant houses. I thought that was kind of a cool little tangent. I thought that was some fun information. So yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Really cool shit. Little slice of ant life there. Exactly. So ants, they also had, as I'm sure some of us are aware, very thick skin that was similar to bark, and they mm. made them very difficult to harm with conventional weapons. But obviously they're, they're tree-like, so they did have a weakness to axes and fire. Right, that, may, that stands to reason. Um, when aroused, <laughs> the ants are very strong. Very hard, very strong. <laughs> very hard, very strong creatures. Their powers of strength resembled the age-long actions of trees accelerated. The power of the ants was very interesting and cool. Yeah. Yeah, like, for example, crushing rocks and moving earth in seconds. Yeah, they used that. We've talked about this before, like, to tear stone apart. They used, mm-hmm. like, the power of roots. They, like... Yeah. Because what do trees do over time? You come across a big old tree, and it's, what, it's lifted, like, the foundation of the of a, a sidewalk or something. Yeah, yeah. Or straight up into there, this big old piece of cement. Mm-hmm. So the ants, they have this power of things that trees usually do over long periods, but they can just do it right now. They'll just take that rock, and they'll throw it. Mm-hmm. They'll just rip something apart. It's so, yeah. it's cool. I yeah. thought that was cool. According to Mary and Pippin, their punches can even crumble iron like tin. Yeah. And tear apart, like you guys are saying, the, the solid rock, uh, like bread crust. I like, remember like them That's use, a good way to I describe it. I remember them using that description in the text, yeah, like bread crust. Yeah. Mm, bread Just crust. crumples. For some reason, that made me hungry for fresh bread. Anyway. Yeah, I kind of want a big loaf of sourdough right now. Ooh, yeah. Sourdough. Okay. So Treebeard, he even boasted himself about the strength of the ants. He said that they were much more powerful than trolls, even. And then he went on to explain that trolls are actually just imitations of ants and not nearly as powerful. And we know how powerful trolls are, right? Yeah. So yeah, he uses the word counterfeit. Oh yeah, they are, but yeah. counterfeit ants. Yeah, counterfeits. Yeah, that's what he says. Fence. Yeah. Okay. Trolls are but counterfeits. Yeah, ants are essentially like de facto immortal, like we said earlier. Mm-hmm. But they can be damaged or killed with sufficient force, right? Yeah, like we said, axes, fire, they got some weaknesses to those. Right, yeah. And because, sure. of, because of their long lives, ants, are, they're very patient and cautious. Very yes. patient, very cautious. Don't be hasty. Yeah, they're known for being very deliberate and slow in thought, decision, and action. They got the time. Yeah, at one point in the text, they decib- they consider a three-day deliberation a hasty measure. Yeah, that was the ent moot. Yes, the ent moot. That Pepin were at, yeah. Is, they consider that a hasty move. That was, uh... Yeah, they were like, man, we really rushed that ent moot. Yeah. Only took us, you know, uh, what, 72 hours? Mm-hmm. Shit. 
Yeah, 72 hours. That's really fucking fast. That was real fast. That's like when you, like a murder trial, when you hear they del- the, the jury deliberated in 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're just yeah. like, oh, that, that motherfucker was guilty, that was right? Gu- they were guilty. Yeah. <laughs> While they do not die of old age, uh, as they get older, ants become uh, tree-ish. Yeah, you may have heard Treebeard talk about that before. He does, yeah. That's where they'll, they'll settle down in one place and they'll start growing roots and leaves. Like trees. Like a tree. And eventually they cease to be conscious and they become that tree. Yeah, they just perma tree. Which in a, in a way is old age, I guess. Yeah, it's just like them going tree senile. Right? Yeah. No, why not? Tree nile, yes. Tree nile. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. It is implied that this was the eventual fate of the ants in Middle Earth. Just became right. a bunch of old trees. And uh, they, uh, in that transition, they are actually, there's sort of a, a step between ant and tree, and that is Huorn. Huorns. Do I make you Huorny, baby? Huorny. Huorny. Talking about wood and trees and you know. <laughs> all this shit. This is a very, uh, a lot of erotic subtext in this episode, you know? And, and, and yeah. you might call yeah. it antrotic. Yeah, ant- antrotic. Antrotica. Antro- 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 <laughs> well, there's an unusual no- amount of puns in this episode, yeah, too. Yeah, it's punny. <laughs> yeah, none of these puns have been written, by the way. This is, no. this is all. This is just us being this terrible. This is just being immature. <laughs> this is just us being children. This is just being immature. Uh, mentioned who warns. Let's talk about ants versus who warns for a little bit. Yeah. So who warns? Just to be clear, are technically not ants. However, they may have started out as an ant to begin with. But also, they may not have started as an ant. And they could have just been a, a tree, a simple tree. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, who warns? They're sort of a half awoken race. Right. They're more sapient than normal trees, but not fully sentient like ants. Um, this is, uh, this sort of reminds me of a, um, in one of my, um, f- other favorite books, uh, Speaker for the Dead in the, um, the Ender Quartet. I was gonna say, is that one of the Ender's games? Yeah, one of the Ender's books. They talk about, um, life being a spectrum of sentience, right? Okay. So there's like three different versions of life. There's like simple life, which is like, you know, bacteria, plants, things like that. Mm-hmm. And then there's um, like a, a middle form of life that's like sapient, but not sentient. Like it fears for its life. It can run. It can, you know, like defend itself, stuff like that. Like it has basic emotions and pain and... And stuff like that, yeah. It's kind of kind of wild, you might say. There's a middle ground, yeah. I, I forget. There's three names for them in the t- in the book, and I can't remember the names. Uh, Ruru is going to kick my ass for not remembering the names. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's a, it's a, it's a transitionary period of sapiens, but not sentience. And then you get into like fully f- formed sentient life, which would be like humans and humans and other things. Yes. Okay. So uh, others, you know, sentient life forms, but yeah, um, that's how I kind of look at it. It's like a spectrum of sentience for these, uh, this race here. Yeah. And horns are like the middle one and horns exactly are the middle one. It said that. Over time, ants become more tree-like, and ancient trees become more ant-like. Weird. Yeah, so essentially those old trees become more apt to speaking in tree-ish, and they even start moving and becoming more flexible. Yeah, dude. And yeah, this is where we get the huons. Yeah, I think, I th- I think, I think the kind of cutoff between like lively tree and horn is like being able to move. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. as soon as you're yeah. able to move, you're like a horn now. Yeah, because I feel like there's probably, like, they say the trees can speak. Mm-hmm. But, uh, like, the the elves would wake up the trees and teach them to speak. But I feel like you're not really a horn until you're, you're, you're able mo- to, like, move around. You're moving around. Yeah, you, yeah. you need mobility. Mm-hmm. You're mobile. Well, speaking of this, so let's continue on with the horns. Yeah, let's get a little more specific. Yeah. They they were large and wild tree-like creatures, which could move and make sound, like we're saying, as, as our criteria. Um, and the ants had cared for them um, and tended to them in the second and third ages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the horns, they learned the art of speech, and they could communicate with their shepherds. And by the third age, whether tree or ant, in the beginning, the horns had basically become their own race. There was enough of them that they were just kind of their own thing now. Yeah, this is like the end of I Am Legends, where the <laughs> they just that's they're just a race now. That's who they are. Horns mostly stood as dark, tall trees in the deepest forests, gnarled and unmoving, yet watchful. Yeah, and when these horns are aroused, they can move. Very quickly, and they're also known to be able to like wrap themshell- th- themselves in shadow. 
Mm. It's uh, kind of like uh, Ungoliant Online. Yeah, sim- it, it is a similar thing. I don't think it's necessarily no, it the yeah. same, but it is very similar in the way they wrap. Similar themselves. effect. Yeah, it's spooky. Or, or weren't Balrogs kind of that? Also, they, yeah, they kind of. We, yeah. yeah, we talked about that in the wings debate in the Balrogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right, wrapped in shadows. Yeah, but the Huorns were also known for having a deadly strength, and they were just brutal, merciless creatures. Mm-hmm. Trees without conscience. Right. Yeah, and the, the <laughs> assault on Isengard is a really good example of yes. this. The horns did a fucking number on Isengard. Uh, so we've actually got a excerpt here about horns. This is from the Two Towers, but this is not from Treebeard. This no. is from the chapter Flotsam and Jetsam. Nice. That's an, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, it's a good one. Mm-hmm. Read by Mr. Trevor. Take it away. We came down over the last ridge into Nan Kurinir after night had fallen, Mary continued. It was then that I first had the feeling that the forest itself was moving behind us. I thought I was dreaming, but Pippin had noticed it too. We were both frightened. It was the Huorns, or so the Ents call them in short language. There's a great power in them, and they seem able to wrap themselves in shadow. It is difficult to see them moving, but they do. They can move very quickly if they are angry. You stand still looking at the weather, maybe, or listening to the rustling of the wind, and then suddenly you find that you are in the middle of wood with great groping trees all around you. They still have voices and can speak with the Ents, but they have become queer and wild, dangerous. I should be terrified of meeting them if there were no true Ents about to look after them. Great great groping trees reminds me of Evil Dead, I'm just going to say. If you remember that particular scene, that was that. Uh, it's yeah, that's a it's, it's sort of a traumatizing scene for some people. Yes, uh, it's fucked up. It's, it's a fucked up, fucked up scene. <laughs> it's a fucked, fucked up, up scene. Yep. Yeah, the horns scary. They scare the shit out of me. Yeah, total, totally scary. Yeah, without direction from the ends, the horns would ultimately become a threat. They'd become a problem to pretty much anyone near them. And uh, it's said that some of the horns were black-hearted and rotten. Yeah. Old Man Willow is said to be a good example of this. Yeah, he's just a mean old tree, just out to fuck with the hobbits, and he almost fucking killed Pippin, didn't he? Like, he, yeah, he wanted them all dead. Yeah, yeah, he was not. Yeah, he was not happy that Old Man Willow. The uh, in in this context, the horns kind of uh, make me think of like um, maybe like the ants that got rabies and went crazy, and you know, like they're all the rabbit, oh, yeah. rabbit, the rabbit, the rabbit, the rabbit, rabbit ants. trees, rabbit ants, um, are kind of kind of like uh, like stray animals, you know, they're just like that's what they, that's kind of what they are because they're wild yeah. and shit, feral, so. feral. It's like the feral difference, ants. the different uh, back to Fallout, the difference between a feral ghoul and a regular ass ghoul that like works and <laughs> works, lives works in for the city. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Here you go. But more parallels between Fallout and yeah, there's uh, just so <laughs> many, yeah, so <laughs> many parallels. Shall we move on to the one thing everybody wants to know about? Oh yeah, this is one of the mm-hmm. more mysterious things about the the Ents, right? And that's the Ent Wives. Yes, one more type of Ent, the Ent Wives, which were just the female Ents. Yeah, we got a little tiny excerpt here uh, from Treebeard again, <laughs> read by Joel. The Ent Wives were bent and browned by their labor. Their hair, parched by the sun, had become the hue of ripe corn, and their cheeks like red apples. Yet their eyes were still the eyes of our own people. Ent ent eyes sound, um, I don't know, almost terrifying, really? Yeah, they sound mesmerizing. Yeah, they they sound, uh, they use the word penetrative or penetrate a lot when they use the word eyes, or when they talk about the eyes of Ents. Yeah, there's definitely something special about them. He reiterates that a lot. Well, we talk about this, like, you know, how, like, you can see the age of people in their eyes sometimes, you know? Imagine how old, like, what it would be like to look into the eyes of something that's that fucking old, right? It would be pretty crazy. It'd be wild. Treebeard described the Entwives as fair, especially in their youth. The Entwives are described as desiring order, plenty, and peace. Yeah, this is kind of unlike the Ents who wished to just speak with the trees and let the trees grow wild. The Entwives, on the other hand, they wanted to be obeyed and they wanted the plants to be orderly, you know. They they were kind of like farmers. Right. They wanted to farm. 
Yeah. They wanted agriculture. They were into agriculture. Cultivation. Exactly. Yeah. Cultivation. Cultivation. Yes, yes. yes. While well, ants preferred uh, to tend larger trees and forests, the endwives, they created gardens because they preferred to control and cultivate small things like vegetables, grass, and flowers. Treebeard makes a comment that they uh, they would have liked the lands of the Shire. Oh, I'm sure they would have loved Oh, it. yeah, highly cultivated. They would have loved Minnesota. Look what mm. we did to the prairie, dude. We got rid of it. <laughs> dude, we got <laughs> rid of it. We got we got <laughs> fucking rid of it. There's like, um, for those of you who don't know, Minnesota used to be like a third of it was covered in the prairie. Mm-hmm. And I think now there's less than 10% or less than like 1% of the prairie left. We totally devastated it for farmland. Yup. Public service announcement. Look what we did. Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> no more prairies, <laughs> just farmlands. The prairie, if you guys have ever been to a, I know a lot of you are from far and wide listening to this, but if you've ever been to an actual prairie, it's it's fucking like mesmerizing. Like that, like it is like six yeah. foot tall grass, like just. It's an ocean of grass. It's an ocean of, yeah. Waving. Yeah. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Come to the prairie, guys. Come to the prairie. Yeah. So uh, the ant wives. So because of the differences between the ant wives and the ants, they did ultimately become estranged from their husbands, and this likely happened sometime during the Second Age. But we'll talk about that more in a second here it's when like, we get to the history of the ends. Yes, it's like they got a um, I think got like a race divorce or a, a, a gender divorce. <laughs> I, I guess they just kind of were done with men, and they just were like fuck these guys. We could govern ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, what do you call like a civil war that's along gender lines? Like, what the fuck? I don't know what you'd call that. Still, it's still a civil war. I gender mean. war, yeah. yeah. Gender yeah, war, so. yeah. gender war, civil war. So let's take a moment and talk about the language of the ants because that is also something very unique about them. The ants spoke a slow, exhaustive voc- vocabulary. Old Entish appears to have been based on an ancient form of common uh, elderin. Uh, later enriched by Quenya and Cinderin, though it included many unique tree-ish additions. And, and think about it this way. Common Elderin, as they're talking about, so like pre-Quenya, pre-Cinderin, uh, elvish tongue, right? Mm-hmm. Quendi means what? What does that word mean? Do you remember? Elves. Those who speak with voices, right? Oh. This is literally, they speak the first language ever languaged, ever. Common Elderin. I didn't even realize that. I just realized that as we were reading this. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. It's the oldest language that, uh, like, what the first thing to speak with a voice created this language. So they speak literally the oldest language yes. that exists in Arda. Yeah. The oldest language ever languaged. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Dude, ants have got to be pretty smart. I mean, yeah. To, for, to that sort of like information retention. Mm hmm. Originally, the ants had a language of their own, described as long and sonorous. Yeah, it was a tonal language, kind of like Mandarin. Like Mandarin. I was thinking like Man Bird. Do you remember Ugly Americans, that show? Oh, like the race of man birds? Yeah, and all they said was suck my balls, remember? That's... But you had what? to say... Ugly yeah. Americans, the TV show that yeah. was on for like one season and then disappeared? Two seasons, friend. Two seasons. Okay. Great it's, show. It's a deep cut, but yeah. yeah no, deep I, yeah, cut, I remember the man birds. Rue yeah. is going to appreciate this. The man birds, they speak a language. So this this guy that was a douchebag taught them to speak. So he taught them how to say like fucked up things like suck my balls. So suck my balls can mean like a billion different things because of the tone in which you say suck my balls. Right. Of course. Of Isn't course. that like the only thing they say? Just how you say it? They, say a, cu- they say a couple different things sentences yeah, and i yeah. can't remember what the suck other ones balls. are suck my balls i remember though <laughs> i think uh a lot of folks out there might, might not get that m- reference might might more sooner catch the reference of groot from oh yeah groot <laughs> does a similar thing yes like man bird <laughs> <laughs> of course what a comparison yeah yeah it is it's actually unknown if any non-ent could actually pronounce old entish correctly yeah it was filled with many subtle vowel shades and it was very long winded yeah it's almost like if you're not a tree your mind can't comprehend a language that drawn out right yeah so in fact only ants spoke entish yeah not because the language is a secret like with the dwarves but basically just because no one else could seem to get it yeah dwarves kept kuzu a little secret for a reason and ants just nobody cared to learn it yeah i mean not even the elves yeah, not even the elves. the elves. The elves are like, we're goody on, on that language. Even the master linguists, the elves, they, not even they could learn Entish. Mm-hmm. And I, they didn't really try too much either. It was just so complex. Oh, we have we have an example of an Entish word. Yes, uh, we do. Oh, 
Can I give this a go? Yes, yes give please it a try. do. You will, I think we we should all try to give it it's, a go. It's uh, okay. A la 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 rumba <laughs> commanda lindor burume, which is just the word for hill. Just the word for hill, oh. or possibly a specific hill. The name of a specific hill, but either way, yeah. La 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 rumba uh, commanda lindor burume. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do this like tree beard. Okay, you do ready? <laughs> Alla la rumba commanda lindor burume. Okay, I got I got to try this one. Yeah, do okay. it, do it. Alla la 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 rumba commanda lindor burume. Which is <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of lalas in the beginning. Alla la 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 la. la, la. That reminds me of uh, la, la, la. Bob Loblaw's Law Blog. Oh yeah, Bob Loblaw's Law Blog. Yeah, from uh, <laughs> from uh, Arrested Development, wasn't it? I think it was Arrested Development, but Love. yeah, some people out there probably think I just said blah, 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 so it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was Bob La Blah, La Blog, Bob La Blah's La Blog, <laughs> Bob La Blah, Bob La Blah, Bob La Blah, Bob La Blah, okay, that's difficult, yeah, okay. <laughs> Oh boy! All right. How about we get another example of uh, of Entish in oh, here? Yeah, right. another one. And yeah, we got another known Entish word. Burarum. Burarum. Now that anytime I I think of like Treebeard saying something, I think of that word. I think yeah. of that word because uh, uh, John Rhys Davies delivered it so well in the movies. Burarum. Burarum. Yeah. By the way, that means orc. Means yes. orc. Yeah, it means orc. Yes. Yes. And that's yeah. why Treebeard says it with such disdain. Yes. He hates the orcs. Okay, all right. I just kind of find it funny. So this was one tiny word is equal to this three-letter word in English. <laughs> but this other word for hill is like a yeah, sentence it's long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Entish. Weird language. Yeah, the grammar structure of Old Entish was quite bizarre and often described as lengthy, long-winded, and uh, it was just a lot. There may not have even been a word for yes and no. Yes Jesus and no. Jesus Christ. Yeah, what? right. Right. Yes and no questions would usually be answered with a long monologue on why the ent in question did or did not agree with the ent who asked the question. <laughs> yeah. So you get yes or no and then a very long explanation as to why. Oh my god, that's so annoying. Like uh, uh so like <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have to answer questions in long form like that i remember like learning spanish growing up the teacher would always make you reply in complete sentences and i'm like yo when the fuck do people actually talk in complete sentences come on let's let's be real here right people yeah. talk in fragments yeah like, speaking i feel like speaking is much different than like writing out a full sentence you yes know? <laughs> yes so ends as a rule they would say nothing in old entish unless it was worth taking a long time to say it as we all know from the famous line. Mm -hmm. uh, but for everyday language, they usually use something like Quenya or Westron just because that's what the people around them would use, so it was easier. Uh, but we do have an excerpt here from the chapter Treebeard, read by Danny. I'll call you Mary and Pippin, if you please. Nice names, for I am not going to tell you my name. Not yet, at any rate. A queer, half-knowing, half-humorous look came with a green flicker into his eye. For one thing, it would take a long while. My name is growing all the time. And I've lived a very long, long time. So my name is like a story. Real names tell you the story of the things they belong to, in my language. In the old Entish, as you might say. It is a lovely language, but it takes a very long time to say anything in it. Because we do not say anything in it, unless it is worth taking a long time to say and listen to god damn I, it i hate dude. even reading it honestly <laughs> i was like this is like taking so uh, like i'm doing it for dramatic effect but i'm i wanted it to end so fucking hard <laughs> Honestly, the amount of free time that Ents must have to speak this language, I just, yeah. I, who has time for that? Yeah. I just, I'm jealous. Well, like, this is how they speak Westron. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah they already are slow <laughs> yeah. with regular freaking what languages. The fuck? This is their fast words. Yeah. Yeah. This is shorthand for them. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Shall we move on to some history? Yeah. So Historia. See. 
Let's round things off with the uh, a general history of the ends, so the events, you know, from beginning to end. Back in the back in the beginning, when there was light, the, Gen- el- the, the genesis of the ends. Yeah, the the elder days. Yeah, let's jump back to the elder days. So throughout the elder days, all the ends tended their lands in these huge, vast, primordial forests that used to spread across Middle Earth. Yeah, the forests were much larger and more prominent back then. At one time, much of Eriador was forested. Elrond stated at the Grand, uh, the Council of Elrond that a squirrel could go from tree to tree from what is now the Shire to Dunland, west of Isengard. Yeah, yeah. pretty wild. Yeah, that's like forest from like, that's ba- what, that's basically like the Misty Mountains all the way west to the sea. To the sea, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, so when Baron and a force of green elves waylaid the force of dwarves returning back from the sack of Doriath, the dwarves are routed and scattered into the woods where the shepherds of the trees ensured that none escaped because they were everywhere at that time. Yeah. And this is, as you might remember, if you remember your, your Tolkien military history, <laughs> yes. this is the battle of Sarn Athrod. Yeah. This was towards... The end of the first stage, right? This is after mm-hmm. the socking, uh, after the, the, the sacking of Nargath, uh, <laughs> Doriath, right? Of Doriath, yeah, yeah. And these ends are su- uh, supposedly summoned by Baron and Luthien. Like they're that cool, yeah. That they're just like, you know, fucking ants. Help me, hell yeah. I mean, Baron and Luthien. I guess they are pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. but that's some, that's some special favor, though. Mm-hmm. If you're friends with the ants and you can get them to help you out, that's some special fra- f- special favor. One of my favorite Tolkienerings that recently came up, it was actually done by Trevor in the uh, Tolkien Mysteries episode, was that the sons of Dior might have been led away by Ents. Oh, yeah. Because they, that Dior would have known the Ents from the Battle of Sauron Athrod. Mm, I love yeah. that. That was so cool, right? Everything, wow. everything is connected in a giant web, you know? Yeah, it's all connected. I mean, if the Ents are friends enough with their family to come help Baron and Luthien in this fight, maybe, yeah, maybe they would recognize the kids and go, just go save them. And it does specifically say DR fought in this fight, too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah so, yeah, like, absolutely. yeah, he was there. Absolutely. Shall we, shall we move into the second age? Yes. Let's do it. Second age. An age of change. Yes, a transitionary period, if you will. During the Second Age, the immense forests of Iriador were either cut down by the Numenorians or destroyed in the War of Elves and Sauron, which we remember was kind of a big deal. Yeah, there was a lot of deforestation that happened in the Second Age. Yeah, Fangorn Forest was the the eastern end of that immense forest and uh, one of its few remnants, actually. Uh, The shrinking of the forest that happened during this time only solidified the separation between the Ents and the Entwives. It only helped further their divorce. Yeah, and this separation caused the end to any new Entings being born. And uh, Entings, that those are just very young. That's the term for young Ents, little juvenile Ents. Do you think they have to, like, plant them in the ground or something? I... Do you think they gestate, maybe? I don't know, honestly. I mean, <laughs> I mean fuck, yeah. are they, like, giant fruit, maybe? They grow up out of the ground. Yeah. I was just thinking of uh, this being the, the plot of uh, Children of Men. Like no, no children being <laughs> With born. The ants, yeah, yeah, it's like the children no of ants. ants. Children. Yeah. <laughs> children of ants. That's a great sequel. I ants. should do that. <laughs> children, of an, children of the ants. Children of men rules. If you've never seen that movie, check that out. Children of men is a is a great. It's good and sad, as we say yeah, here. It's good and sad one. Um, yeah, during this time period, the ant wives they crossed the Anduin and they made their home in the region just east of the Anduin River and south of Murkwood. After yeah. Morgoth was overthrown, their gardens blossomed, and they taught the local men agriculture. Yeah, they have just had a whole beautiful, blossoming farmland of the Endwives. It was beautiful. Yeah. However, during the conflict that ultimately led up to the Last Alliance, Sauron decided to destroy the land of the Endwives, and this is when that land became known as the Brown Lands. This is the Fellowship passes by the Brown Lands at the end of the... Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah, and they actually, uh, the last alliance passes by the Brownlands on their way to Mordor as well. Yeah, he, he sort of... It's recently devastated. Yeah, he destroyed the Entwives land and turned it into the Brownlands as a way to intimidate and slow down. Slow down the advancing... The advance uh, of the last yeah. alliance, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like an intimidation tactic. Like, yeah. look at this. Whoosh, scorched yeah. earth. Ugh. This is you. I mean, if any uh, if any creature that sort of uh, plan is going to work against, it's going to be creatures made of wood. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. So uh, after the destruction of their homes and gardens, all the Entwives were either killed or scattered, and they were never seen again 
in Middle Earth, which is very sad. Yeah. And uh, this is actually somewhat of a built-in Tolkien mystery, um, and Tolkien wanted it that way. Mm-hmm. But in one of his letters, uh, Tolkien wrote that he believed that the Entwives were all slain or enslaved after the War of the Last Alliance. We've got a letter. Um, this is from letter 144 of the letters of J.R.R. R. Tolkien to Naomi Mitchison. It is read by Trevor. What had happened to the Entwives is not resolved in this book. I think that, in fact, the Entwives had disappeared for good. Being destroyed with their gardens in the War of the Last Alliance when Sauron pursued a scorched earth policy and burned their land against the advance of the Allies down the Anduin, they survived only in the agriculture transmitted to men and hobbits. Some, of course, may have fled east, or even have become enslaved. Tyrants, even in such tales, must have an economic and agricultural background to their soldiers and metalworkers. If any survived so, they would indeed be far estranged from the Ents, and any reproachment would be difficult, unless experience of industrialized and militarized agriculture had made them a little more anarchic. I hope so. I don't know. I love how he says he hopes that if they experienced industrialized and militarized agriculture that they would become more anarchic. Wow, that's funny. Anarchy. Anarchy. I love that. I just love that how he just ends it. Like, you wrote this, man. Yeah. And he just ends off like, I don't know. I hope so. But I, I, don't, so. But I don't know. Like, what, do you, what do you mean you, you don't know, know? I would hope that the characters that I invented would act that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, I just love when the author is perfect. You know, he wants it to be a mystery and he, yeah. just, he tells someone, I don't know. Or he's about just, something he wrote. And he's just like, I don't know. Maybe yeah. he's just too lazy to write anything about. He was too lazy to do it. He didn't, well, write, I, he didn't I, want to write it. I mean, I guess, he cool can, I guess he can't constantly always be coming up with additional details for everything all the time so i mean i guess at some point he's just gonna have to say i don't know but i actually agree with you trevor because i mean everybody knows that tolkien was known for being lazy right (laughs) 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 just like total total slothful bastard that guy almost made me spit out my water all over (laughs) i I thought you were gonna ruin the computer for a second (laughs) oh man well the ants searched for the end lives for centuries uh, but they never found them, of course. Very sad. Uh, it is sung by the Ents. Very ants sad. Sung. Very sad. Very sad. The, the Ents sing that one day the ant, uh, Ents and the end wives will find each other, but um, there's very little hope among the Ents that this would actually happen. Also very sad. Also sad. Rebert implored the hobbits uh, to send word to him if they ever found any news of the ant, wi- ant wives in the Shire, but, um, you know. Nothing ever really came of it. Yeah. There was that rumor that uh, Hamfast saw a walking tree that one time on the edge of the old forest. Oh, that's true. Uh, but uh, that's, as far as we know, that's just a story. No one's really sure whether that was like a horn or an ant or yeah. an ant wife. No one's sure. Nazgul? A, Naz- <laughs> a tree-shaped Nazgul, a tr- yes. A tree ghoul? A tree ghoul? <laughs> tree ghoul? Trees ghoul? We've had a lot of portmanteaus in this episode, just <laughs> smooshing words together. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so the the loss of the Ent Wives, that's really the last major thing that happens in the Second Age regarding the Ents. There's a lot of deforestation and the loss of the Ent Wives. Could we also call that de Deentestation. 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 I'm sorry, should I, should I stop now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he loves his poor man, tells this guy. <laughs> so on that note, let's move on into the Third Age here and talk about the what happened with the Ents in the Third Age. This I'm sure a lot of us are probably familiar with. The Ents being in the Fangorn Forest? Yeah. 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 So that's sort of their, their main location in the Third Age is the the Fangorn Forest. Well, the Huorns, however, still lived uh, elsewhere. Yeah. Like in the Old Forest. Like the Old Forest. Like we mentioned, Old Man Willow. Yeah. Old Man who Willow. That prick. <laughs> Fucking piece of shit. <laughs> Let's talk about the War of the Ring as, you know, the Third Age kind of uh, comes to a head there. In about the age, uh, in about the, the year 2950 of the Third Age, Saruman's armies began cutting down large numbers of trees in Fangorn Forest, Dick. Yeah, and naturally, this upset the Ents. And during the War of the Ring, the Ents, who are usually very patient and deliberate, they were finally spurred to action by Merry and Pippin. Agitators. Agitators. That's what they, <laughs> that's what they are. Keep on agitating, guys. They convened an Ent Moot. Ent Moot. Ent, that's a fun word. Yeah, Ent Moot. Which is a meeting of the Ents at uh, Derdingle? 
Derndingle. 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 Oh, there's yeah. an N in there. Derndingle. Yeah. Every time I try to think of Derndingle, I always want to say Dingledale, but I know that's... Dingledale? But that's Dingledale. Not the Dingledale, but that's that not That sounds right. like a mall. <laughs> Dingledale Mall? I went down to Dingledale Mall. They have a Spencer's there. I wanted to get a uh, titty mug. Went down to the Radio Shack at the <laughs> yeah. Dingledale Mall. <laughs> Holy shit. We were just dating ourselves here. Spencer's <laughs> Gifts and Radio Shack? Holy shit. Oh my god. Oh, man. Radio what? Radio I'm just going to go down to Circuit City after I rent a movie from Blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Uh anyway. So <laughs> Pippin World. remarks that the end moot was one of the strangest things that he had ever seen. And uh, we have an excerpt from Chapter Treebeard read by Joel. When the ents all gathered round Treebeard, they bowed their heads slightly. Then a curious and unintelligible conversation began. The ants began to murmur slowly. First one joined, and then another, until they were all chanting together in a, in a long, rising and falling rhythm, now louder on one side of the ring, now dying away there and rising to a great boom on the other side. Though he could not catch or understand any of the words, Pippin found the sound very pleasant to listen to. That reminds me of uh, at the Metrodome when they would do the wave, remember? Oh, the wave. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I remember at Monster Truck shows, they used to do that all the time. The oh, wave. yeah. yeah. I'm sure most folks have been to any big you know, stadium events. They're probably sure. familiar with the wave. Yeah, the wave. Oh, wow. So cool. So cool. Yeah. One of the greatest human inventions, really, I think. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> So after a three-day-long, three-day-long deliberation... Remember, this is hasty for them. Yeah, this That's is right. hasty this for is them. This is that hasty deliberation. Three days. The Ents reached the conclusion to march on Saruman's fortress at Isengard, known, which came in what came to be known as the last march of the Ents. God, I love this scene in the movie, and the soundtrack oh, kicks it. up, and then Treebeard says, the last march of the Ents. So fucking... Oh. Yeah. So it's fucking cool. It's just super intense. Yeah. Honestly, it. the Ents were probably the reason I love the Two Towers so much. But yeah, that's what I, that's the Ents are one of the big reasons why the Two Towers is the best movie, in my opinion. So led by Treebeard and obviously accompanied by Merry and Pippin, the Ents they totaled about fifty total Ents, but then they also had an enormous army of Huorns, which is honestly the Huorns are kind of what I'm terrified of. Yeah, they're the real baddies. They're tr- they're like they're basically <laughs> they're basically ants without a fucking conscience. <laughs> like that's what they're yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're like they're rabid. <laughs> they're yeah. just raw. Yeah. The no filter wild ants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. And they, and they only speak treeish, right? So like exactly. you don't know what they're saying yeah, as they're no like running at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> I've never been so slowly terrified in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but as we know, these trees, they destroy Isengard, and they just tear it apart. They even tear down the wall around it. Oh, yeah. We got a little mini zerped here um, from the Two Towers Road to Isengard. Just a sentence long here that sums it up pretty well. If the great sea had risen in wrath and fallen on the hills with storm, it could have worked no greater ruin. Damn. 50 ants. 50 ants and, 50 an, ants. and an army Stronger than the sea. Stronger than dropping the sea from the sky? <laughs> <laughs> damn. Damn. Speaking of dams, they actually even destroyed the dam yeah. that Saruman had built holding back the river there, and that just absolutely flooded Isengard. I have a question, though. Yeah. Was that dam a goddamn? Goddamn dam? <laughs> Uh, got him yeah. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's not my joke it's from Beavis and Butthead to America is this, a, uh, is this a goddamn they're at the Hoover Dam oh man great joke is this a goddamn <laughs> is this a goddamn well the only thing they could not destroy was Orthanc yeah I don't know if you guys remember this from the books but uh, right. yeah Saruman ultimately he's en- he ends up trapped in Orthanc but that's because the, the Ents it's the only thing they couldn't tear down they were yeah. actually hurting themselves trying to like harm the stone of Orthanc, but something about that Numenorean uh, engineering. engineering is something about that smooth black stone. They they just He's, yeah they could, for some reason they could they find couldn't. no purchase. Yeah. They on just, the stone. They just could not. It's like uh, it's like what Elrond says, no 
they have no tool or means to destroy yeah. it. No, yeah, and I think that by that, no craft we here possess. Yeah, <laughs> I think at the point where they got to throwing their bodies up against Orthanc, I think that's when Treebeard like Let halted. Yeah, that's when he like halted everyone and made everybody calm down, and they like retreated into the shadows well, and for like, a little bit. Like, let's be honest, we have no quarrel with the building. <laughs> Like, have our no old quality. homies built the building and left I don't it know, here, man. You know? I don't know, man. Currently, at that point, it's a symbol of Saruman. I mean, at that point, I feel like they're liable to tear down anything they want, but... Yeah, uh, I suppose, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Hold on, I, if they're crushing... If they can crush rocks, why can't they just, like, catapult throw each other up there? I guess that's a... That's, that's a, a good, good question. Good or question. why don't they just like stand on top of each, each other, other like spears? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> you know, like a ladder, <laughs> just give me a boost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Toss yeah. him like a dwarf. Yeah, there you go. Come on, these are these are ants we're talking about here. I feel like if they really, really wanted to, they could have brought down the tower. I <laughs> really feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because they couldn't tear down the tower, Saruman trapped in there. And trapped. If, yeah, totally trapped. And a few days after the assault on Isengard, the ants, they spent some time defending Rohan from orcs, attempting to invade the, the region of Istamnet. Yeah, just the eastern region of Rohan between the Entwash and the Anduin River. They just out there cleaning things up, you know, just uh, sweeping around, taking out any extra orcs. Yeah, there you go. I mean, unless you get a flamethrower, it's going to be hard to fight. You even want it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Tolkien, Tolkien noted that the destruction of Isengard by the Ents was based on his disappointment in Shakespeare's Macbeth. <laughs> I this love was, this. Yeah. This was something I did not know previously, but I thought was very funny. Yeah, Tolkien explained that while watching the play, he was always disappointed when uh, Burnham Wood uh, came to assault the castle uh, in uh, Dunzanane. I think is how you say that, Dunzanane. Uh, but it was also um, it only amounted to men wa- to men walking on stage with leaves in their hats. Yeah. So basically, Tolkien thought that the final battle in Macbeth was always weak as fuck. Weak. As so fuck. he decided that when he did that scene for himself, he do it right. Yeah, we're not just going to get some silly men with leaves in their hats out here. They're going to be trees tearing things apart yeah. and booming in armies of horns. And Oh, man. Sounds like, I mean, the leaves, he kept the leaves part. I, I, yeah. yeah, I suppose. Yeah. You know. Honestly, I don't know if he knew this or not, because it was around when he was alive. But if you're trying to watch a sick-ass adaptation of Macbeth, check out Akira Kurosawa's Throne of Blood. That movie rules. Oh, yeah, that Kurosawa. I haven't seen that Kurosawa movie yet. Yeah, it's uh, the ending is fantastic. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Hell yeah. How about the fourth age, boys? Yeah, yeah, the War of the Ring, that rounds off the third age, as we know. So mm-hmm. let's let's talk just briefly about, you know, the fourth age and moving forward with the ends. Yeah, after the War of the Ring, King Elastar, the Invinitar, gifted the ends with the Valley of Nankurinir. Yeah. AKA the valley that Isengard was built in. Yeah, yeah, the big valley that they just flooded. And they yeah. love that. They love that it's flooded now. Drink mm-hmm. it all up. No, they love it. Keep, keep they your lo- spoils. They love it. Yeah, Aragorn even declared it an Entish realm and granted the Ents complete autonomy and self governance. Oh, yeah. He's like, this is for you. Just, this is all you. We're not going to bother you at all. You do whatever you want here. He gave them complete autonomy. Entomy, <laughs> what? Yeah, I got portmanteau. There's so many of them. Got to squeeze a few more in. <laughs> oh, entomy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the ants, they did ultimately move many of their trees there, and the place became known as the Watchwood or Treegarth of Orthanc. Treegarth. I thought that was a pretty cool title. Always garden that Orthanc. Is that the uh, tree, the uh, Entish version of Treegarth Brooks? Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, I know. Oh, fuck I'm, me for that one. I'm man. not even gonna give you a laugh. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> fuck fuck that joke. The tree beard rolls. <laughs> in the tree beard strikes. <laughs> god damn it. Oh god. So after Aragorn was crowned king, he promised Treebeard that the Ents could prosper again and spread out and across the land and, and take new lands and renew their search for the Ent wives. Mm-hmm. However, Treebeard lamented. Explaining that the forests may spread, but the ants would not. Oh. <sighs> Treebeard predicted that the few remaining ants would remain in Fangorn Forest and dwindle or become treeish. Damn. Yeah, he basically just said, I think the ants' time is coming to an end. An ant? Oh, God. Damn. Can't stop. Can't stop. Won't stop. <laughs> 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 However, before Gladriel left Middle Earth, she prophesied that the ants 
and elves would meet again after the world ends. You know, when everybody meets. Mm -hmm. Uh, When the world is renewed in the second spring of Arda. Also known as the Arda Envignanta. Envignanta. Ah. Envignanta, which is uh, Quenya for new spring or the uh, spring of Arda. Yeah, I think it means renewed Arda, I think. Arda renewed. Because Envignatar means renewer. Ah, there you go. Right. Arda renewed. And we've got a a beautiful, hopeful uh, excerpt to end this off for us today. This is going to be from The Return of the King, Chapter 6, Many Partings, read by Danny. Then Treebeard said farewell to each of them in turn, and he bowed three times slowly and with great reverence to Celeborn and Galadriel. It is long, long since we met by stock or by stone. Ah, Vanyamar, Vanyamalian Nostari, he said. It is sad that we should meet only thus at the ending. For the world is changing. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. And I smell it in the air. I do not think that we shall meet again. And Celeborn said, I do not know, eldest. But Galadriel said, Not in Middle-earth, not until the lands that lie under the waves are lifted up again. Then in the willow meads of Tessernion, we may meet in the spring. Farewell. Yeah, so that's where we're pretty much going to leave you for this episode, guys, on Ents. Yeah, that's about all the information we've got for you today. So just some... Final thoughts before we let you go. Uh, the Huorns are terrifying. Terrifying Huorns. creatures. Yeah, like like we said, they're ants without conscience. <laughs> without <laughs> conscience. They're terrible. No self-control. So, interesting though, I hadn't really thought about this. So we've got Treebeard. Mm-hmm. He's been around since the origin events, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have to assume. Okay, yeah. so so like, how long does it take for an ant to have Entmentia and, you know... And, and become treeish. become treeish. I think it's like something that happens to some of them, but not all of them. I, I think, think it depends on their activity. Like if they right. stop and slow down, like they said, and start taking root, then they kind of go treeish. Right. Oh, so, yeah. Interesting. So yeah, tree beards. Tree beards a rolling stone. It seems so. He never really mm-hmm. became treeish. Yeah, you, you know, rolling stones. What is it? Aren't covered in moss or something like never that? Gathers moss, never right? gathers moss. Mo- never gathers moss. Never gathers moss. I'm a rolling stone, all alone and lost. Also. Horns make us straight up horny, baby. You yeah. make me horny. You make me horny. Or do I make you? No, horny? do I make you horny, baby? <laughs> do I? <laughs> yeah. Let me show you my bark. <laughs> uh, also, I thought it, it's very funny. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how we got through this whole episode, you guys. We, we, there's, know, there's, we there's, barely did it. We there's bar- no chance that we could do a whole episode and, and not. <laughs> oh God damn it! Another <laughs> portman too. Holy shit! None of these were written. Uh, you guys <laughs> have to believe us that we did not write a single portmanteau for this episode. We normally do write little jokes and put them in the outlines, but yep. not this. Not this. It no. just happened. These are these are just on the spot. <sighs> it's okay. okay. Uh, also, well, also another thing that's funny. Well, I guess while we're talking about jokes, another thing I thought was funny was just the fact that Ents are the only ones that speak Entish because they're the only ones that can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah only, exactly. only their brains are wrinkled enough. Yeah. 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 Everyone else is too smooth brain for that. <laughs> smooth brain, yeah, exactly. Um, I think just as a as an assertion, I think if Tolkien probably could make any of his races that he I- invented real, it would probably be the Ents because Tolkien loved trees, mm. and the trees need somebody to fight back for them. Yeah, they fucking do. Just like the Lorax said, right? Because Tolkien is a lot like the Lorax, right? <laughs> I right? guess. Yeah, I suppose. Right, he's, he's, a, got, he's got that respect for trees. He's yeah, the, the I, Lorax I could see that. of. Uh, I could see that. J R R Lorax. Yeah, J R R Lorax. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I hate this show. Why do you guys listen? to I us? hate this show. <laughs> <laughs> Never doing this again. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, final thoughts went well. Let's talk about next week. All right, well, we're back, guys. This is season eight, and uh, I think I think we think you're going to like it. This is going to be a fun oh, yeah. season. It's going to be a good one. Uh, next week, we've got episode 97, where we're going to be talking about three of the Lord of the Rings fan films that came out over the past years, what, 20-odd years 20 now? 20-odd years now. Yeah, and uh, if you're unfamiliar with what a fan film is, it is a movie that is made 
my fans for no profit. Yes. In order to be able to use the IP. Yep. <laughs> so you can make a movie based on this IP, but you cannot profit. So that's what these are. And we're looking at three of them. Yes. yes. Three that actually had notable budgets. And we, yeah, and we watched them um, um, uh, last weekend or the weekend before. Mm-hmm. And um, it was fun. It was yeah. fun. It was fun, really fun random fact. Yeah, we even found a bonus one that we yeah. didn't know was out yeah, there. Yeah, we did. We only intended to watch the two, and we found the we third found and was like, Hell yeah, this is like, good too. Fuck it. This wow. is, yeah, it was like 15 minutes long, so we were like, fuck it, let's do it. Yeah. Is anyone yeah. going to say it? <sighs> Intended? Oh, God damn it. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> okay, we're going to go now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening to KOT Podcast, guys. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on new episodes. And please rate or give us a nice review if you like us because. <laughs> This is top-notch content, you guys. I think you'll all agree. Top-notch. Yeah, now, a big thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, you're a huge help to us. Huge. Don't forget to go subscribe on Patreon to help support us. It's patreon.com forward slash K-O-T podcast. Subscribing there also can unlock some exclusive content, so check it out. And uh, we also accept private one-time donations. If Patreon's not your speed, just contact us via your whatever means you'd like social media email whatever and uh, we'll make something happen we appreciate you speaking of social media feel free don't forget to and definitely you should go to our discord check us out there we'll have a link in the description it's where we tend to get up to most of our shenanigans Shen- shenanigans yeah, yeah yeah discord's growing every day we got memes we got conversations we got places to ask questions and episode chats all good stuff yeah discord fucking rolls i love interacting with you guys on discord so yep. much fun You'll also find us on TikTok at keep underscore on underscore Tolkien underscore podcast. Uh, we're, we're still on X for now. Uh, formerly <laughs> yeah, Twitter at, at KOT podcast. Um, you know, we, we have Facebook at official keep on Tolkien. Uh, Instagram at keep on Tolkien podcast. We still have our merch store at T-Mail, which is uh, keep dash on dash Tolkien dash podcast dot T-Mail dot com. Definitely check that out. Yeah. To uh, get some goodies based on all of our content. Get some KOT merch. Get some KOT merch, yeah. Some of that's very, very specific to our podcast, so <laughs> it check is, yeah. that out. <clears throat> I just have to, one, one last time before we sign off, we said the word content a lot in that. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to beat the shit out of Trevor as soon as <laughs> If I, I'm not here after next episode. <laughs> yeah. Trevor is no longer part of the KOT podcast. He has been fired and immediately murdered. <laughs> this we'll just, is my end, guys. We're just going to continue recording without This is him. your end? Did you do it again, you piece of shit? Okay, I hate you. We're going to go now. We got to go. I can't believe it. Oh, God. I'm Danny J. And I'm Joel N. I'm Trevor D. And together we are Keep on Tolkien. God, I hate Trevor sometimes. Are you ready, Danny? You're going to say it? Should I do it like an end? Are you going to make another pun out of what I... Are you going to make another port? It's in the word, man. It is. Oh, my God. You're right. It is in the word. Okay. Aure and Uluva. That was fucking dumb. This is the dumbest episode of KOT.